Good afternoon. Thanks, Skip, for that uh, kind introduction. And thanks to all of you for uh, giving up some of your time today to uh, come and uh, listen to me speak. You know, when you get invited to these things, you never know if anyone's going to show up. So, um, it's a really a pleasure to be here today representing the Ford Motor Company. Uh, this is my first visit to Little Rock. I hope it's not my last. I've got a chance to look around a little bit. It seems like a very remarkable city. It looks like you have a beautiful campus here. Uh, and I'm going to get a chance to tour the library and some of the other facilities after this. So, very much looking forward to it. Um, <clears throat> when I was invited to speak here, I went online and I did a little bit of research about uh, the university and in particular about the Clinton School of Public Service because to be quite honest, although I had heard about it, I wasn't very familiar with it. And I, I really am quite impressed uh, <clears throat> with what I found and with the commitment that uh, the folks here led by Skip and others and the faculty members and, and the students who spend their time to come here uh, because obviously public service is something that's very near and dear to my heart and um, I think that what you're uh, trying to accomplish here really embodies, you know, what I believe is the future of public service, um, which is that quite simply our leaders of the future need to be socially responsible, as well as great in their particular uh, area of expertise. Whether it's in government, business, science, uh, the arts, tomorrow's leaders will be required to seriously consider all the actions um, that they will take and how those actions will impact each one of us and the communities we live in, and that's whether we're here in the U.S. or anywhere around the globe. You know, that's not to say that <clears throat> leaders of the past weren't thoughtful and mindful of what was happening uh, in the world. Winston Churchill once said that the price of greatness is responsibility. Uh, and a little closer to home, Henry Ford, who founded the company that I work for, Ford Motor Company, realized 100 years ago that a company could only be successful if it was a part of the fabric of the communities where it did business. He said that a business that makes nothing but money is a poor business. And today, I think we're following that legacy, and it continues to live on at Ford, and has done so through the, throughout the company's 107-year history. So, you know, as I was preparing for, this, uh, <coughs> for these remarks today, I was thinking about what's going on in the news, and uh, my 18-year-old daughter, Casey, who's a freshman at Western Michigan, came in and said, what are you doing? And I told her I was coming down here to talk to all of you, and she said, well, I have some advice. She said, don't be boring. <laughs> and I think for those of you who've ever had a teenager, I think that's an oxymoron to tell their parents not to be boring, but I told her I would try. So uh, I'll see how one of my, I'm glad she's not here today, because she'd already be giving me hand signals. Um, what I would like to do today is talk to you a little bit about uh, our views on the current economic environment. I want to share what Ford is doing uh, at this time to meet the challenges on that front. And also on the business that I lead at Ford, the Ford Motor Company Fund and Community Services, which as Skip said is really the philanthropic and community relations arm of Ford. And uh, then I hope we'll have some time for some Q&A at the end of that because I'd be very interested in hearing what's on your mind. You know, it's, it's certainly no secret that we're living in very uncertain times. The economy of our country and certainly the entire world is facing some very serious challenges. <clears throat> the news day in and day out over the last year, uh, last year or so has been ominous and quite frankly depressing. I hate to pick the paper up in the morning. You don't find a lot of good news in there. But, you know, this morning the deficit was, you know, $189 billion just for the month of May. Um, <clears throat> and you look at some of the unemployment numbers and things. I mean, who would have ever envisioned a world where the U.S. government is bailing out banks and lending institutions, where General Motors, which is once the largest corporation in the world, is in bankruptcy, and depending on what happens, they could come out of bankruptcy being owned 60% by the government, about 25 to 30% by the union. So our largest competitor will be the, company, will be the government which regulates us. Uh, where real estate, our homes and businesses have lost such significant value in such a short time. Many Americans, for the first time in their lives, are facing unemployment. They're losing family businesses that stood the test of time through natural disasters and world wars. Too many people, not only in the U.S., but around the world, are going to bed hungry each night, unable to make ends meet, and they're worried about losing their homes. And at the risk of being born, my daughter right here, 
I'd like to take a look for just a minute at some of the key economic indicators. The unemployment rate for Maine was over 9.4% in the U.S., and about 600,000 Americans are filing new jobless claims every week. The number of people collecting unemployment benefits is nearly 7 million. It's the largest record, it's the largest number on total, total on record since 1967, and it's the 17th straight record week. The for, forecast for real GDP growth for 2009 is now about a negative 2.5%. Prime interest rates about 3.5%. So what does all that mean? Well, I wish I could give you the answer, because even the smartest people in the world with the highest economic degrees or with crystal balls can't seem to find common ground and explain it. I think the only thing that's certain is that the recovery won't be quick. It appears it will be long and slow. Experts say the best hope is that we'll bottom out later this year and begin the steady uphill climb to recovery. In my business, the car and truck business, the annual sales rate so far this year is below 10 million units. A year ago, at the same time, the industry was selling at a rate of 14 million units. And in 2007, we were at 17 million units. So in about an 18 to 20 month period, we dropped from 17 million units to 10 million units. The impact on the auto industry, I don't have to tell you, has been devastating. General Motors is in bankruptcy, Chrysler merging with Fiat, I guess they're one day now out of bankruptcy. Uh, and even the once powerful auto juggernaut Toyota is reporting record losses. The industry's closed dozens of plants, we laid off thousands of people around the world, and we've eliminated once proud, proud brands such as Oldsmobile, Plymouth, and Pontiac. And while Ford has not been immune to any of this, I would like to argue today that we are a little different. You know, our recent struggles are well documented. Like our competitors, we've had to close plants, we've had to reduce our workforce, and we've reported record financial losses. But what makes Ford different is that we had a restructuring plan that began in 2006. And as a matter of fact, in the first quarter of last year, which wasn't all that long ago, we were profitable. But then the economy went into the tank, and traffic in our auto dealerships basically dried up. We have focused on reducing our costs. Our focus is on our core brands, Ford, Lincoln, and Mercury. We sold off Aston Martin, Jaguar, Land Rover. We've significantly cut our investment in Mazda. And we've announced that Volvo is available if the right deal can be made. But it's gotta be made in cash. <laughs> no checks. Our restructuring plan called for these actions, including one that is viewed as shrewd and brilliant by most economists today, as a matter of fact, our own CEO, uh, Alan Mulally, calls it the uh, world's biggest home improvement loan. With the backing of our executive chairman, Bill Ford, and the Ford family, the company leveraged all of our assets, including that beautiful Ford Blue Oval that you see all around the world. And this resulted in our company raising more than $23 billion. That money was used to fund our restructuring efforts, and it wasn't just used to pay off the costs that are incurred when you lay off employees and close plants, but also we invested in new technologies. And that's the reason that Ford has not had to seek emergency financing from the federal government the way that GM and Chrysler have. So far, we remain control, in control of our own destiny without government assistance. Another thing that makes Ford different today is what you see on the road. We just built and sold our 100,000th hybrid vehicle, the Ford Escape Hybrid, which was the first hybrid SUV ever sold. And oh, by the way, that vehicle happens to be built right here in the United States at our Kansas City assembly plant. The new 2010 Ford Fusion Hybrid, which you're starting to see out on the road, offers 41 miles per gallon. That makes it the most fuel-efficient mid-size sedan in the world. We have more insurance for highway safety, top safety awards, than any other automaker, and more five-star safety-rated vehicles than any other brand. And then we have this new sync technology that you might have heard about that we developed with uh, Microsoft, um, <clears throat> which, which allows us to put some technology in our vehicles that does everything from tell you directions, especially for guys, that's a really neat feature to have. You don't have to, you don't have to ask, you don't have to use a map. But you can also get the movie listings, the sports scores, five-day weather forecast, pretty much any information you have because we tie it into the satellite radio system and it, it, it does amazing things. So we're proud of the progress we're making and committed to staying on track and delivering on the brand promise. We're a 107-year-old company that played a big role in helping to deliver the American dream. Unfortunately for a lot of Americans, that dream is either dying or dead. 
but we're still working at helping people realize their dreams today. Our founder, Henry Ford, is credited by Moses, as the man that put the world on wheels. And even today, the Ford family still plays a strong role in our company, which also makes us different. Our executive chairman is Bill Ford. He's the great-grandson of Henry Ford. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about the area that I do business in at Ford, which is the Ford Motor Company Fund and Community Services, which is our community relations activities. And yes, it is a business, and that's how we run it. The fund was established back in 1949 as a separate organization funded by the company. So we're a separate 501 3C from the company. We're not an endowed fund, meaning we don't have an established pot of money that we draw from. Our funding is given to us each and every year by the company based on corporate profitability. When times are good, we get more money. But even in times like these, I'm proud to say the company stands up to its commitment to being a good corporate citizen by financially supporting our efforts in the community. One of the first questions I generally get from people when I go out and do um, programs in the field and, and give grants to nonprofits is, you know, have you not been reading the papers, Mr. Nala, because, you know, your company's in deep trouble and you're laying off all these people and you're losing money and, you know, what are you doing out here giving away money? Well, we don't give, I tell people, we don't give away a penny or a nickel. But we do make investments. We make investments in money. We make investments in organizations and ideas that are helping to make the world a better place. Our top priority is education. We invest in, in education for a number of reasons, but mainly because we believe doing so creates win-win opportunities for everyone involved. Think about the students. They get opportunities that they might not otherwise have. I was at a program in New York on Monday <clears throat> and I couldn't make up stories like this because I'm not that smart, but there was a woman who came up to me at the end of my uh, remarks and said, 40 years ago, the Ford Motor Company gave me a scholarship to go to college, which if I wouldn't have had that scholarship, I wouldn't have been able to go. She now has a PhD, she's an assistant fire commissioner in the New York City Fire Department. And she said without that, she probably would have been a clerical or administrative worker. She's also put her own three children through college, and they all have master's degrees. Teachers in schools get resources they want to do their jobs more effectively. And the community and the business world get more responsible, educated, and skilled citizens who are prepared to make a positive impact on communities and businesses. And it provides for a better and sustainable future, not just for Ford, but for all of us. So, based on that, you might say, well, what does Ford get out of it? Well, first of all, we believe that better educated people are better customers. And sometimes, we even get these students that we've helped out to come and work at Ford. And when we do, we know we're getting better employees. So from our perspective, supporting endeavors like education is a business case that's easy to make. We also know that when people are aware of good work a company does in the community, they tend to support that company more. People like to be associated with and buy products and services from companies and organizations that care, especially when those companies support children and education. Last year alone, here in the U.S., we invested more than $17 million in education-related programs. We're working with partners at the Smithsonian Museum in Washington, as an example, to develop innovative traveling exhibits such as Freedom Sisters, which profiles 20 African-American women who made significant contributions to the civil rights movement. We're investing in American heritage by supporting efforts such as the refurbishing of Mount Vernon and Gettysburg National Park. And we've even underwritten a unique program that supports classical music. It's called Four Made in America. The company collaborates with an up-and-coming U.S. composer to develop a score of music that is then performed by a network of 65 smaller symphony orchestras, representing at least one city in each state. In fact, Four Made in America was performed here in Arkansas at the end of March in, the Pine, Bluff, in Pine Bluff by the Pine Bluff Symphony Orchestra. The first composer in the series was Joan Tower, and she actually won three Grammy Awards for the piece that we commissioned. So that's just another example of how we're helping to build a better society. As an auto company, obviously, safety education is a key initiative for us. We partnered with the Governor's Highway Safety Association to develop a one-of-a-kind driver's training program called Driving Skills for Life, which gives high school students both classrooms and hands-on experience. And we know when we target an area, it works. We worked with uh, Tazewell County in Illinois that had 15 deaths in one year, one 12 month period, one 12 month period, where they had 15 deaths uh, of teenagers because of auto, auto accidents. 
You know, the number one cause of teen death in this country is automobile-related accidents, I'm sad to say. After we targeted the program with the state of Illinois in the next year, the next 12-month period, they had one death. But being a good corporate citizen and a responsible business is more, is about more than just providing money. It's really about being part of a community. We made a major commitment to this back in 1990 when we established a program that allowed its employees to take two paid days a year to volunteer for community projects. Then in 2005, Bill Ford announced the formation of what we call the Ford Volunteer Corps. It's based on the model of the Peace Corps that John Kennedy had many years ago. It's a well-organized unit made up of thousands of employees and retirees who volunteers at hundred, hundreds of community projects annually. Last year, we had 18,000 employees uh, volunteer 100,000 hours, and in income, so that was an in-kind value of $2 million. Now that's just the stuff we capture. I know there's a ton of other stuff going on, but that's the stuff we know about. And they've done everything from disaster relief uh, with Hurricane Katrina when it struck New Orleans to provide volunteer support for organizations that help the needy in our community through programs such as food banks, homes for abused and neglected children and women, counseling and education centers for drug and alcohol abuse. And I'm always amazed at the generosity of Ford employees. We had a program last year where it turned out there was no funding for the Meals on Wheels program in the city of Detroit. There were going to be 40,000 senior citizens who wanted to get a meal on Thanksgiving or Christmas, and we're counting on it. And they asked us to make a contribution, so we did. So they'd have money for the meals, and then the next day they called and said, by the way, we need volunteers to deliver the meals. Oh, left that part out. <laughs> So I put a note out to our employees in Southeast Michigan at 1 o'clock. By 1.45, we were oversubscribed. We needed 500 people each day. Then I got a bunch of angry emails from people saying, How did you, why'd you do it at 1 o'clock? Because I wasn't at my desk. It wasn't fair. And I'm already getting people asking me, can we do that this year? And, you know, the amazing thing about it was they don't know these people that were getting that email. They've never met them. There wasn't a name. There wasn't a face. They just did it. I've been the president of Ford Motor Company Fund for more than two years now. During that time, we've changed the way we operate the business for a number of reasons. Obviously, the state of the economy is one. We needed to work smarter and be more than just a provider of dollars. We've stopped providing funding for large capital campaigns and are now focusing on grassroots and community efforts. We're targeting our support more regionally than at the national level because we believe we can have a greater impact in local communities. And fundamentally, we've shifted our approach to one where we view ourselves as partners with our communities and work more closely with them to meet their needs. And believe me, the needs are greater than they have been in this country for a long time. Many organizations that I work with, such as United Way and Salvation Army, say that people who two years ago were contributors and supporters are now standing in line asking for help. And they've never been in that position before. And I've met with some of these people, and they could just as easily be sitting in my chair or yours. When times are tough, it's important, more important than ever, that we pull together as neighbors. And we're encouraging the organizations that we work with to do just that, because you need your neighbors even more in tough times than you do in good times. We want them to go beyond that mindset and work together to share best practices and focus on the end result, which is helping the people who need help in our communities. So we're working with community organizations, our partners, in new and innovative ways. We're providing funding and volunteers, but we also provide leadership in getting them to work. So you might again say, so tell me again why you're doing this? Well, part of it is, quite frankly, because it makes good business sense. Our customer research, which we've done extensively, shows that customers want companies to be responsible, that employees, our own employees, feel better about their company when they know that it does the right thing. And investors are more likely to put their money into a company they believe is helping to make the world a better place. So sometimes I tell our management, they ought to be thanking me for all this hard work that I'm doing. The same research shows us that when people are told about the good work that a company does, it positively affects the image of the company, its management, its brands and its products, and it ultimately results in increased product consideration and sales. At Ford Fund, we recently ran a two-minute advertisement in movie theaters in select markets around the country talking about what we're doing. So if you've ever been in a movie, you know, if you happen to be one of those people that gets there early, I'm always walking in late, two minutes late. Um, but if we did it for G&PG movies for exactly that reason, reason, because people who have kids, they take to the show, they go early, so you get them their popcorn and get them settled and take them to the bathroom at the last second when they need to go. 
but it talked about what we did in the community, and then we interviewed 500 moviegoers to see what they thought. The results were really more impressive than what I had hoped. 44% of the people who saw the ad named Ford as a good corporate citizen, compared to 21% who had not seen the ad. So we went from 21 to 44, which is double, and that was, that was with just one advertisement. Then we asked the respondents if they would be more likely to recommend Ford. 71% said yes, versus 41 who had not, 51, excuse me, who had not seen the ad. More importantly, and this is where the rubber meets the road for us, 67% of respondents who saw the ad said they were more likely to purchase or lease a Ford vehicle the next time they were in the market, 67%, compared to 50% who had not seen the ad. So it's important for our company to tell this story so the public is aware of the impact that it's having on the community. Because building a better world is building, is part of building a better business. Community relations efforts need to be embedded into a company, not an afterthought. And that's why we at Ford are continuing this commitment. It's part of our DNA, but it also helps our business get stronger. At a recent conference attended by leading CEOs from around the world, it was noted that even as resources dry up and stock prices no doubt, nose dive, CEOs recognize the value of continuing to support their communities. A year ago, only 17% said that the economy was important in determining cash contributions. This year, 72% said the economy is an important factor, but despite that, not, they don't want to cut back on giving. They recognize the value of being responsible corporate citizens. Good companies today need to be successful on Wall Street, but they also must be successful on Main Street and that requires commitment. Bill Ford often reminds us that a good company delivers excellent products and services, but a great company delivers excellent products and services and strives to make the world a better place. I'm proud to say that Henry Ford's legacy of giving is alive and well, and we're committed to lending the helping hands needed to make a difference in our communities. It's really clear to me that this university and all of you are taking the lead and acting responsibly and drawing attention to the issue of public service. And we want to thank you for that. And for the students who participate in this program, I know some of you, uh, I understand a lot of the students are away and hopefully they'll watch this on videotape. My message to you is that you'll go on to positions in government and business and in nonprofit organizations with the education and skills that you will need to truly make a difference. If you ever doubt why you're doing this, if you ever question why you've chosen this curriculum, when the outlook looks so bleak, rest assured that what you're doing is important and will make a difference in every community you get involved in. In this complex world, you will stand out no matter what field you enter. The education you're receiving here positions you, positions you as tomorrow's leaders, and I commend you and the university for having the foresight to focus on public service. And to show our appreciation on behalf of us at Ford, uh, we're, uh, I'd like to share that we're working with Skip on a, a partnership with the university in the development of a, of a program that will be provided to students who attend graduate courses here. We haven't worked out all the details just yet, and I'm, I'm waiting to uh, have more time to talk to Skip and get his ideas on how this might work, but you'll be hearing more about that, that in the near future. Um, I, I'd like to thank you uh, in by thanking all of you again for coming today, Skip, for this opportunity. If you ever run into my daughter, her name is Casey Bella, tell her her dad is not boring. <laughs> of course, she won't believe you and say, he probably paid you to say that. Um, but uh, hopefully you got our message, which is that we believe, we really firmly believe, and we now have research that backs it up, that shows this isn't just about building a better world. It's really about building a better business, and it's not an option. I want to leave you with one, one final quote to, uh, thought before we open things up for Q&A. Uh, I'm a real big fan of Winston Churchill. I always tell, when I was in speech writing for Bill Ford, I used to say, he used to say, why do I have to do the speech? And I'd be, because it's like doing the Winston Churchill speech without Winston Churchill. You know, without him, it really wasn't much of a speech. But Churchill once said, we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we get. So thank you very much for listening.
Bob's going to get you money. Okay. Uh, thank, you. <coughs> thank you for coming. You were very, very informative. Uh, there were a couple of things that you said that I think are very, very important. A company that just exists to make money is not a good company. That one of the things lacking today may be that social responsibility component that you're trying to forward. Some years ago, you had an executive that left Ford and took over a company called Chrysler, Lee Iacocca. Uh, he designed the Mustang. When he went to the government, it was unheard of to ask for help. Today, we see companies doing it. He turned that company around because he chose to try and improve a company that fell flat on his face. I don't see that in today's CEOs. You seem to take the opposite old line approach that you're part of the community. And I think that's uh, commendable. And I'm hoping that this message goes out to the rest of the CEOs in the country, because that's what we need. Well, uh, thank you. I mean, you, you know, I don't know that there was a question there, but I'll make a comment on it. I mean, when, you, when your founder starts doing this 107 years ago, I mean, I can tell you stories about, you know, he, in 1923 or 1922, when they had the second uh, meeting of the Disabled American Veterans Convention, uh, in San Francisco, and he heard about it, and heard they needed vehicles to to take some uh, veterans from one part of the country out to San Francisco. And he gave them 13 Model Ts. I mean, he didn't put out a couple of citizenship report. You know, he didn't have some NGO calling him on the phone and saying, "How come you aren't helping these people?" He just did it. So when you do that, I mean, the thing that I think makes Ford different is the fact that we have always done this. So we do want other corporations to join us in this effort. And there are a lot of other good companies out there that are doing that. But the bottom line is it's not just about writing a check. I do know some companies out there, I won't name them, that write a check and think they can just write the check, walk away, and then, you know, hang a gold star on my forehead, you know, because I, I wrote the check. That's the, that's the easy part, quite frankly. It's getting out and working with community leaders, having our people involved, getting our dealers involved, which is a new effort that we have underway because they're really the face of Ford. And I think if we do that, um, we can play a leadership role and be part of the solution as opposed to be, being part of the problem. And it's okay to do it. You know, for a while, some companies, especially if you're in bankruptcy, you know, the government doesn't really want to I don't know what the other company, I don't know what some of these other companies are going to do. You know, if you're taking government money and all of a sudden you start to reinvest it in the community, I don't know how, I don't know how that works. And I, but I don't have to figure it out. Actually, I have a statement uh, to affirm what you said. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, we always appreciate the wonderful guests that the Clinton School will bring to Arkansas. But I want to affirm what you said because uh, as a teenager in the 60s, my father always bought a Ford. He said he'd always have a Ford because of what we did in the community. So I wanted to know that it goes back in my memory. Hello. Well, well, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. You got two good ones right there off the bat. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Sarah, Sarah's got the question. We're trying to make it three in a row here. Hi, my name is Sarah Colfarb, and I'm a recent graduate of the Clinton School of Public Service. I wanted to ask you, you um, served as the executive in residence at the University of Michigan, and I was wondering um, what you think about the shift of MBA programs into a more social entrepreneurship sort of model in which corporate social responsibility is taught as, as part of an MBA. Well, um, I still teach there a hard time. I hope that's okay to say. Um, and they're very near and dear to my heart. And one of the things that we do, I teach in the business school at the University of Michigan on their Dearborn campus because it happens to be a stone throw from uh, our world headquarters, so it's really easy for me to get back and forth. And one of the things that uh, we are doing there is actually we're starting a corporate citizenship program, uh, kind of a boot camp that anybody that comes into the business school is going to have to take. It's like a one or two credit hour kind of program that we're going to start. But also, we believe, uh, and I personally believe, that it has to be part of the of the program. It's got to, just like it has to be embedded in the business. It isn't just going to happen all of a sudden when people get into the business world and become a manager, an executive director, you know, a vice president, and you go, well, all of a sudden, you know, I'm going to become community minded. It doesn't happen that way. Believe me, we that needs to be incorporated. This whole not. Uh, Issue of public service and corporate responsibility, and, and the you know I tell our when I go in, I have to go give a pitch every year to our senior management on why they should give the fund money. And last year was a pretty tough year. 
right to go in because we were in pretty, not in very good shape last December. And I said, you know, I start my business by saying, just as we have a responsibility to our employees and our shareholders and our customers and our dealer partners, we have a, we have a responsibility to the, to the community. And it, and it, it may, you may, it may take a different form in difficult times, but regardless of that, um, it has to be part of what we are. So I think that's really important to get students involved and to get young people involved. And as a matter of fact, most of the research that I've seen say young people really want to be a part of this. And when they join for it, a lot of them come and see me and say, how can I help? What can I do? Let's start, you know, another program. Let's do this. Let's do that. So I think it's terrific. And also congratulations on your completion of your coursework. Question someone here went over here. Sure. Wait for them. Well, unfortunately, I don't have a question, <laughs> but I am a proud Ford owner for the last 20 years. And Thank I, you. I cannot. T I didn't buy it because I was buying a Ford. I just thought you guys make a great car and it has the greatest ride. <laughs> but, but that's a good that, reason to buy a that's car. That's a good reason to buy a car. Thank you. But with that being said, I did not know about the corporate restructuring that you all have done. I think probably most Americans don't, and I can't tell you how nice to know it is that there are corporations and people out there who are really doing what the rest of us believe we should be doing, which is being really Americans, which is looking out for everybody and everybody having an opportunity. And I'm also glad to know that I can buy a car from you now that's a hybrid, and I will be buying it. Well, great. Thank you. You can see me after. We'll sign you right out. <laughs> great question. Bye. Um, I wanted to make two Points. My great uncle was a test driver for Henry Ford at the very beginning. It was three great uncles, Uncle Ed. Now, my daughter, our older daughter, we graduated from Rhodes College last night. We wanted to help her buy a car. And so she came home one day from work and said, Mother, Ford Motor, come with me will offer a nice discount for their employees. So I said, how much is a nice discount? And she told us. So she went online and located a car locally. And so we made two people in the family happy. My husband got a new car, which was her own car. <laughs> <laughs> I know how that works. Yes. <laughs> So his car on eBay, and she has a new car. And we want to thank the Motor Company for honoring the employees. This is her first job. Okay. Great. Okay. I hope All she right. enjoys it. All right, question. I just saw the movie Flash of Genius. Are you aware of that film? This is the uh, uh, windshield wiper. Yes, uh, the windshield wiper. Like the, the, the windshield wiper. The, the, the intermittent windshield wiper that Ford basically stole it from. Now, everybody is just singing their praises, and that's wonderful. That's great. I'm glad that you have programs that do this, but do these programs in any way, are they set up just to offset the killing conscience that these big corporations have because of the double dealings and things that they normally do as a part of business? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sending when it comes to these things, and I'm asking a simple question. So, I need to know if, if these things are set up to absolve themselves from some of these crimes and misdemeanors, or is this just basically the set of conscience that Ford has always had? I'm, I'm sorry, I have to know. Uh, first of all, you never have to be sorry for asking questions. <laughs> questions are good things. But, um, uh, you know, I can only tell you my personal view and my experience as a company in the 20 years that I've been there. I don't think this has anything to do uh, with absolving a guilty conscience about anything, quite frankly. And the reason I say that is we were, we've been doing this uh, really for 107 years. You know, some of the examples that I gave earlier about the disabled American veterans and what we've done with um, uh, contributions over the years, and of great magnitude. Um, you know, this year alone we've invested, we will have invested $30 million uh, in the U.S. And, you know, we have an ex if we wanted to, I mean, I'll take the, the other version. We, I mean, the company very easily could have said, you know what, this is the time to get out of this stuff. We don't need to be doing this anymore. Uh, we've got other ways to spend our money. So, when I see the, I mean, the volunteerism certainly has nothing to do with you know, employees' guilty conscience. 
know, when you give up your Thanksgiving or Christmas Day, and I don't have to go twist people's arms, most of them. And when I go out on volunteer projects and meet with employees, they say, look, whatever you do, keep us going. We want to do this even if we have to pay out of our own pockets to do it. Right. But I mean, it is all part of one corporate program. So my personal view is, you know, I think we are trying to do this because we understand that a sustainable society, we need a sustainable society to have a sustainable business. So from that perspective, is it self-serving? It's like what I said about the education piece. Hopefully someday some of those kids are going to come work for us. Well, all of them know. So, good question, I hear you. Uh, thank you once again for being here. Community development means different things in different settings. So I apologize if I missed you giving this definition earlier, but what is your corporate definition of community development? Well, actually, we're changing the, uh, the, the, uh, the way that we define that. And, and as a matter of fact, today I, I met with a couple of folks from the Little Rock community, uh, one of whom's here today from City Connect because we are going to a regional approach as opposed to a national approach because I think in the past some of what we've tried to do it for is define that from you know corporate headquarters and the one thing that I've learned is you can't do that you can't run a community relations a national community relations program from Dearborn you've got to get out of the community so it means different things in different cities we actually have a project right now called Operation Goodwill where we've started to work with seven markets um, and we've set up an advisory committee in each of those markets that is comprised of our dealer partners and some of the nonprofit partners that we work with. And we sit down with them and we create a mini Ford fund, if you will, in their market and say, what are the needs? Because it's different. The education, some things go across the board. I think like education, some of the music and arts programs that we do go across the board. But even within that, in the different markets, it's, you know, it's how do you support the educational needs and what's already there and what's the infrastructure. But certainly it is, I think the first part of, the, of defining it is assessing what the community need is. And it's changed. Right now we're seeing a lot more need in the, what we call the basic needs area. So we've shifted some funding from, from that. As a matter of fact, there's a story in the New York Times that yesterday that I think was in the local paper today that talked about the shifting, how people are shifting, how they're spending their money on charities. And unfortunately, one of the areas that's been hit the hardest is basic needs, and that's where we're seeing the biggest need. So I think the first part of defining it is saying what, we have to go out and assess what the community need is. And then the second is um, making sure that there is, first of all, the capacity to, to manage that issue, and then looking for those partners that you work with that give you, quite frankly, best return on investment. I mean, when we work, for instance, on some of the hunger projects, some of the nonprofits we work with on hunger, we ask them for their, what does it cost them to deliver a pound of food or a ton of food? And when their numbers are out of kilter, we go in and say, how come? You know, how come? So hopefully that answers your question. One more question. Yes, ma'am. I'll give back. My name is Elise Siegel and I, I represent Baptist Health here in the Wild Markets. Uh, we uh, have the largest diploma granting nursing school in the country. So one of the things we need the most in Arkansas are qualified nurses. Uh, we have a scholarship program that we offer. What's the best way to approach the Ford Foundation for support and do have an advisory council in our community? Uh, we do not have an advisory council here yet, but it is something that we're, we're talking about. Um, you can uh, always write to me directly at jbella1 at ford.com and we'll get that in or you can find us on the web at the ford.com website and you go to, it says Good Deeds, it's got my picture right underneath it, Good Deeds, my mom would be very proud of me, my, the nuns who taught me would be shocked, uh, but uh, uh, you can contact us through our website, we've got a process for how you apply for grant applications and things and, and certainly job retraining. Jim, one thing we can say is that we will tell Casey you weren't boring, and then when she graduates from college, please tell her to give a good look at the Clinton School. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen,